here for the first time, this is the final sermon in the seven-part series through the seven churches of Revelation. And I wanna suggest to you, this is probably the most well-known of all the seven churches, the church of Laodicea, right? How many people are familiar with this church? The question I'm gonna ask is the title of the sermon. It's really one we need to process personally, and here's the question. What do you do when Jesus leaves your church? Because that's what happened to Laodicea. What do you do when Jesus leaves your church? Now, two phrases in this book make it well known. The first one is, and you know this, uh, I wish that you were either hot or cold. You're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, so I'll vomit you out of my mouth. You know that phrase. The second phrase that we've heard a lot is Jesus stands at the door and knocks, right? You know this phrase, open the door and let him in. I have used those phrases, like some passages you've heard, to summon lost people far from God to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and enter a relationship with him. How many people heard those phrases used like that? Me included. The problem is, when you understand the context, you realize, get this, Jesus is not talking to those who are far from God outside of the church. He's actually talking to those inside the church who already profess to know him. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to you and he's talking to me. And so if you have a Bible, I hope you do, that's what we're gonna learn. How do we have church? How do we live our Christian life where it's not separate and apart from Jesus Christ? If you have a Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter three. Uh, we like to say word at Long Hollow. We know the word changes our life. So if you add verse 14, you can say word. word. The word of the Lord. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as, I, now this is crucial, as many as I love, I what? Rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Let's pray as we begin. I'll pray for our offering and then I wanna pray for our time together. Father, we are grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the words of your scripture are spiritually discerned. And so without you, Holy Spirit, there's no impact, there's no understanding, there's no illumination. We welcome you into this place today, Jesus. We, we ask that you would move in our hearts to participate in this offering that's coming next week, God, that we can all participate so that on the back end we can all celebrate. We only want to give what you lead us to. So help us to pray this week about how we should respond. And God, we pray that you would speak to us personally today. We're listening, we have a seat at the table, speak to us now, we ask it in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. Let me give you three insights if you're taking notes. The first one is this, Jesus is saying right out the gate, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Now I mentioned earlier that for years I missed uh, understood this passage and even mispreached this passage, I think, like, like a lot of you. You heard preachers preach this passage this way, right? Uh, Jesus is saying you need to be hot or cold. Hot is good, on fire for God. Cold is bad, someone far from God. But I'd rather you pick a side than ride the middle. How many people heard that, right? Hot is good, cold is bad. I don't like lukewarm people. The problem is when you put the passage back into the context of the region, you realize it doesn't mean that at all. So take a journey with me for a moment, six miles north of the city of Laodicea to a city called Hierapolis. 
Hierapolis was known for having hot springs that bubbled up from the Lycus Valley. And I'll show you a picture of these hot springs. These hot springs would pull up in these different pools. Now, this is a picture of a public bathhouse that people could come to, but they also had private bathhouses, and they also had even bathhouses that circulated and transported the water into your own home. Now, why was this important? Because if you were sick, you wanted to travel, and people did this from all over the region. They wanted to travel to Hierapolis to benefit from these hot waters for rejuvenation, right? Restoration, to be restored again. Now take a journey with me nine, nine miles southeast of Laodicea to a town you're gonna know well called Colossae. Colossae, you may know, from one of the New Testament books that Paul wrote to the letter of Colossians, right? The church of Colossae. Colossae was known not for the hot springs, they were actually known for something different. By the way, we, are, we still have some spots left for our Asia minor trip in October. We planned it around fall break if you wanted to take your, your student or your child with you. We're gonna see all of these areas firsthand. We're gonna walk here. You can find out more information, longhollow.com forward slash seven. Not the, not the Roman numeral, but the write it out, seven, S-E-V-E-A, seven, you get the point. But we'll see this, right? And you'll see Colossae. It's a city that is surrounded by snow-capped mountains that melted throughout the year, and it flooded this, this cold, refreshing water, flooded the city with the rivers and, and the areas, and basically, this is what it looked like. So you had this refreshing, invigorating, life-giving, beneficial water to either drink or to dip in. By the way, uh, this was the first cold plunge before Wim Hof came up with it, by the way. Some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. But those who do, you know what I'm talking about, right? So they were, they were doing like ice baths before this. But the water was refreshing. Now, why is that important? Because Laodicea was right in the middle. Laodicea had no access to water, no clean water to drink or bathe with, so they had to pipe the water through an aqueduct system from the north, and they piped it down from Hierapolis down to the city six miles. Now, you know as well as I do. When you put water through an aqueduct system over that period of time, the hot steaming water becomes what temperature? <laughs> Lukewarm. Lukewarm. And by the time we, they made it to the town, not only was it lukewarm to the taste, it was also nauseating to take in. Why? Because they found, and this is what you'll see when we go there, there is calcification inside of these aqueduct pipes that caused the water to be filled with bacteria and minerals, making it, get this, nauseating to drink. People would come to town not, know, not knowing about the water system. They would take a glass of water, they would drink it, and at that moment, they would spit it out of their mouths because it was nasty to the taste. Come in close. This is why we have to understand the context of the city. Without this, these words mean nothing to us. What is Jesus saying? Jesus says everyone knows the region. Everyone knows the medicinal properties of the hot springs of Heriopolis. They also know the cold, invigorating, refreshing waters of Colossae. But the water of Laodicea was neither hot nor cold like the people within it. Here's what Jesus is saying to the, to the believers, not lost people, believers. He's saying this, you and I know the kingdom of heaven brings healing and wholeness and refreshment to those around. And you're not bringing any of that. In fact, look at your life. You're not affecting anyone with the kingdom. You're not pushing back darkness with anything. In fact, you're shrinking back. You're compromising like the world. You're not making a dent for my kingdom. In fact, you're not a force for good at all. You become lukewarm in your faith. And you know what Jesus does with lukewarm Christians coming close? He vomits them from his mouth because they are nauseating to him. Now, this week I was asking the question, okay, well, what makes a person, what makes a Christian lukewarm? Lukewarm is a person who's not, you, hot and cold are good. 
So that means you're doing what you're called to do, what you're created to do. So what makes a Christian lukewarm? I don't know all the reasons, I'll give you one. I think it's a top reason. And that is, we don't understand, I want you to get this. We don't understand if you're lukewarm, how God made us and what purpose God created us for. If you don't know how God wired you, what gifting and talent God has given you, number one, and then how to use that gifting for his purpose, you'll live in a sense a wasted life, a useless life, a lukewarm life. Let, let me boil it down simple in a simplified way. The two, and write this down if you're taking notes. The two most important moments in a person's life is when they find the answer to these two questions. Okay? And I don't care if you're close to God, far from God. I don't care if you're raised in church, outside of church. I don't care if you're an atheist, agnostic, or you're sold out to Jesus. This is, these are the two, young people, listen. These are the two spiritual markers in every person created on planet Earth's life when they find the answer to these two questions. Number one, here's the first one, write it down. Who made me? Put in brackets, salvation. Why is that important? Because you, if you're a believer, you would recognize, resonate with this. Do you remember the time you realized when you were born again and God changed your life? Do you remember what it was like when God spiritually turned the lights on in your life? You remember that day? And you're like, wow, I didn't know I was wandering in the darkness until the lights came on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't know two weeks, you're gonna hear me blow my life continually, continually, God's grace continued to, be extended to me and I'm gonna share my testimony of how God radically saved me uh, 21 years ago from a 200 plus dollar a day heroin, cocaine addiction, robbed my own family, $15,000. And by God's grace, he just continued to be gracious to me. And I realized that, that, okay, God made me. The God who made everything made me, that's salvation. But here's the second question, equally important. Watch this down, watch this. Who made me, write this down, why am I here? and put in parentheses, discipleship. That's what discipleship is. Who made me? God, in his image, but why am I here? God has put you on earth for a purpose. And until you find that out, everything in life is commentary. Here's how we say it at Long Hollow, look at me. Every person is created for a purpose, what's yours? That should be young people, middle-aged, men and women, single moms and dads, senior adults, middle schoolers, that should be your top priority in life, to find the answer to that. Sadly, many of us spent more time last week filling out a March Madness bracket than we did figuring out what the purpose of our life is for eternity. And if you pick Kentucky, your whole bracket's busted. I get it, I get it, I get it. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Todd, I see that hand. Now, we know this is a big deal, which is why we created something at Long Hollow. You may have heard of it. It's called Discover Your Calling. It takes your gifts and talents, abilities. It takes your highs, your lows. It takes your struggles. It takes your upbringing. It takes your family history. It takes even the, the name you've been given. And it puts all that together to help you discover your calling. You can go online to longhollow.com to find more information about that. But here's the question. Why is it that a church of Laodicea, why is it that they've become lukewarm? Well, Jesus tells us, here's why. They compromised their faith. Second insight, don't waste your life. Number two, don't compromise your faith. Now, the reason they were compromising is three big reasons, and we have to go through these to understand what Jesus is saying. The first one was money. The city was one of the most wealthiest cities in all of the Roman Empire. In fact, they were the banking center of Asia Minor. If you wanted to borrow money, if you wanted to to build it, you went there and borrowed the money and used the money. At AD 60, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, there was a massive earthquake that devastated part of the region. When Rome sent a delegation to go tell them, we wanna help and offer money to rebuild your decimated city, guess what the people of Laodicea said? Thanks, but no thanks, we got it. That's how much money they had in house, so they were very wealthy. In addition to that, they were famous for what? Clothing. 
There was a certain kind of sheep, or it was a black sheep that produced this certain kind of fur that was sought after from all over the region. And so what, did they, what they started doing was importing, I mean, exporting this fine clothing all over the world. Additionally, from selling it, the townspeople actually wore it and they were the most well-dressed, finest dressed community in all of Asia Minor. They wore some of the best clothes, adorned themselves with some of the best outfits. So they were wealthy, they were well-clothed. Number three, they were medicated. In a sense, they had a medical school to deal with medical problems, which was really unbelievable. They figured out a way to take one of these rocks, and I couldn't find the name of the rock, but they took this rock and they crushed this rock up into a powder. And then they provided the powder and mixed it together to produce an eye salve. It's salve. Anybody know this? Who says eye salve? Anybody says salve in here? Okay, that's wrong, by the way. Because uh, I looked it up. I looked it up. And who am I to tell you how to pronounce things right or wrong? But my wife and I, Candy and I, had a little debate between services is if, it, now the dictionary, the pronunciation, which I have to look up words every week, is solve. Who knew this? I solve, or is it salve or so? so. Okay, ointment. Let's go with ointment. Let's just go with ointment. <laughs> eye cream, according to Candy. Eye cream. Okay, they produced this eye ointment that was able to cure infections and bacteria and bring healing to the eyes. Now, why is that important? Jesus is saying to them, since you think you have money and clothes and medicine, you think you need nothing else. But everything you have and you have everything has nothing to do with me. Watch what he says. He says, for you say, I am rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus, tell us what you really think. <laughs> God. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not to be exposed, and there it is, ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Here's what he's saying. Even though, come, in, come in close, even though you're rich in gold, you're poor in soul. Jesus is not against you having things or even money. Jesus is against those things having you. Because you and I both know you can be very wealthy in the world and spiritually bankrupt in heaven because when you have a lot of money, you tend to be greedy and depressed and unsatisfied. He also says you can dress to impress, but that doesn't cover you from your spiritual stain on your soul. So you can have a, the best outfit and adorn yourself with the, the best threads to wear and clothes to, to fashion, but if you don't have someone who covers your sin, you still live in shame and guilt. Even though you're helping others see from their blindness, you're actually blind to your own blindness, and I'm the only one who can open up your blinded eyes. Do you see it? That's what he said. He's just connecting with them. And then he says this line, which really caught me off guard. Now I want you to start buying from me. Isn't that odd? Start purchasing from me. Now, I didn't know I had to purchase something from Jesus. Let me give you another way to think of it. Don't think of purchase as in exchanging money. Think of it this way, young people, downloading from Jesus, right? Think of it this way, older folks will help. Drawing from an account, right? <laughs> Trying to hit all bases here, right? Drawing from an account, downloading. Think of it this way. You're receiving from Jesus, not the world. And so Jesus would say, where are you getting your satisfaction from? Now, in order to understand this, we have to go back to the beginning of the letter because it doesn't make sense. What does it mean to purchase from Jesus? At the beginning of the letter, you notice, Laodicea, Jesus does something different in this letter than he's done in every letter before. When he introduces himself, let me show it to you, he doesn't do what he's done in previous letters. Now, one, there's one exception, I don't have time, but in all the letters but one, he does the same thing. He introduces himself this way. He says, this is what I've done, and this is what I have. I have this, and I've done this. In this letter, he decides to do something different. Here's what he does. He says, this is who I am. 
This is who I am. This is the character of who I am. Watch this. Thus says the what? The amen. The faithful and true witness. The originator. How many people have beginning instead of originator? Originator is a little better. You'll see why. But same thing. The beginning or originator of God's creation. Now, amen, I don't know if you know this, is more than just the final word at the end of a prayer. How many people knew that? Right? You knew it, but you didn't know. You're like, it had to be more than that. Although it is that, but it's more than that. Amen in the first century was a way for you to finish a prayer or a declaration or an agreement by putting this word amen on. And what you're saying is that this thing that we just said is binding and true. So when I said amen, we're saying this is something I'm binding together, it's going to happen. It was a binding agreement. It was also another way to say this is the foundation for everything. This is the thing we build everything on. So when Jesus says, I'm the amen, here's what he's saying, I'm the rock, I'm the foundation, I'm the one you build your life upon from there. So that's what amen means, watch this. What does originator mean? He says, I am the originator of God's creation. The Greek word originator, write this down, is A-R-C-H-E, R-K. A-R, and I don't tell a lot of Greek words unless they have English meanings, but this one does. R-K, yes, it means beginning, but a better translation is originator. But don't think like beginning of a sequence of things. Think originator, you're gonna love this, or archetype. Jesus is the archetype or the originator of the sequence, why? Because he creates the sequence and he owns the sequence. Not only is he first in line, but he owns everything in line because he's the source of all things. Does that make sense? So what he's saying here without saying is this, I'm in everything, I've created everything for me and by me. Now, Daryl Johnson gets it right when he summarizes this. I want you to feel the weight of this. He summarizes what Jesus says this way. What this means is that everything in the universe has the stamp of Jesus on it. From microscopic existence to far-flung reaches of interstellar space, it all bears the imprint of Jesus, the RK or archetype. Do you believe that? Isn't that amazing? That's why E. Stanley Jones could say that the personality and way of Jesus are stamped on your nerves, on your blood, on our tissues, on our organs. The way of Jesus are not merely, this is my favorite line, written into the text of scripture, but into the texture of our being. Is that not why the New Testament says we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? That destiny is written in every cell of life. Every cell of life works best when it operates in harmony with Jesus. All things are intrinsically made, here it is, to work in Christ's way, and if they do, they work well. How many people know what I'm talking about? Before Jesus, you surrendered your life to Jesus, to now, you realize things didn't work the way I thought they would when I was far from God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's why Augustine could say, the, the great uh, father of the faith, he could say, our hearts are restless until we find rest in him. Since you were created by Jesus and for Jesus, you'll never be fulfilled and satisfied until you find Jesus and surrender your life to him. Oh, by the way, did I mention discover your calling to y'all yet? That's why it's important. Because when you discover why you're here and what you're here to do, it changes everything for you. And don't miss this, young people. This is not a one-time acquisition. This is not I walked in aisle as a child. This is not I went to camp, I went to VBS, I signed a card, I went in the water. This is a constant pursuit in your Christian life. You're always pressing in for more of God because there's more of God to have. Can I get an amen? We are constantly going to him for life and joy and health and riches and covering and satisfaction. It's a constant journey of our life. So how do I know? Because here's the question. Because you're like, man, that sounds great. How do I know if I am a lukewarm Christian? How do I know? Here's how you know. 
as you look, and I can't tell you, by the way. Like, in fact, you could put on an act and I would believe, like, man, yeah, you sound like a Christian, you talk like a Christian, seem to be born again. The only person who could know this is you, which is why you have to self-diagnose yourself. Here's the question you need to ask yourself. Have you lost the fire you once have had for Jesus? Have you lost the passion that once was blazing for the Lord? Now, the challenge is you can even deceive yourself, which is why you need a close friend or confidant, i.e. a spouse, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, knows you well, to ask them to speak into your life because we can be blinded to the fact that we're on blind. Here's the reality. Lukewarm Christians are blinded to the fact of their lukewarmness. Like nobody came in here today and said, man, you nailed me, pastor. You got me, I'm a lukewarm Christian. Nobody's saying that in here. What you're saying is, well, I'm not as bad as the guy at the office. He tells dirty jokes and looks at things he's not supposed to. I'm not as bad as him, amen? That's what you do. Because when you get convicted, you always say, well, I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. I'm not asking if you're bad. I'm asking if you're lukewarm. I'm asking if the fire you want, the evangelistic zeal, the joy of the Lord, the passion to read his word, the time in prayer, the silence and silence, has all of that waned? Has the fire gone out? Has the candle smoldered where you have no more, have you drifted from God and now only realize today that you are far from God off course? If you've answered yes to that, here's the fix. There's good news. You know what's so cool about Jesus? He puts his finger on the pulse of a problem and he doesn't leave us there. He says, all right, you wanna fix it. Brace yourself. It's gonna be, it's gonna be life-changing when I tell you this. You're not gonna believe what I'm gonna tell you. Here's the fix for how to go from lukewarmness back to on fire for God. You ready for it? Here it is. Open the door. <laughs> That's it. Jesus says, open the door and let me back in. Look at verse 20. See. Now, this is kind of odd. I thought about this this week. See, John's already looking. What do you mean, see, Jesus? He sees. When Jesus is saying see, this is an interesting word. It's a command. It's, he's saying, look, don't miss this. Look at what I'm saying. Don't miss what I'm saying. I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I have also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, let me make a statement. Bear with me. It's going to seem odd, but let me make this statement. A lukewarm Christian is living without Jesus. Let me say it again. A lukewarm Christian is living their life without Jesus. Now, I know what the pushback is. What do you mean? How can it be a Christian and be without Jesus? I'm not talking about your salvation positionally in Christ. You can't lose what you didn't do anything to earn salvation-wise. What I'm talking about, coming close, I'm talking about intimacy with the Father. I'm talking about the palpable presence and power of God on your life. That's what I'm talking about. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I have preached this verse wrongly. I've used this verse out of context, and I've since realized maybe I was not use it. And let me, just, let me just pull over and part. When I teach you on Sunday uh, and say, this is what I think the text says, this is what I've studied and believe the text to be, that doesn't mean you should just take it and say, well, that's right, Pastor Robbie believes it. Here's the reason. You have to believe what you know, and you have to know what you believe. Why? Because one day you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of your life, and you're going to give an account for what you believed in. And the answer can't be, well, Pastor Robbie told me that. God's going to say, he ain't here. <laughs> Where is he? Right? You're going to have to know why you believe what you believe. Now, you and I, here's what's beautiful about Long Hollow. Our church is big enough where we can agree to disagree on certain things and still worship together, right? Like you don't have to agree what I'm teaching is right. You'd probably be wrong, but I mean, it's on you. <laughs> I could be wrong. I just don't know where I'm wrong, but I believe sincerely what I'm teaching is right. But the reality is you need to know, okay? Does that make sense? If you're going to a church where the pastor says, I'm right and everybody's wrong, run. 
You need to run. That's called a cult. But it's a cult, okay? Now, back to the sermon. Okay, here we go. The verse I preached is, I preach this verse evangelistically. Like this is an opportunity where Jesus is knocking on the doorpost of your lost heart and he wants you to be safe. Candy and I were even, I don't know if I should do this, but I'm not allowed to, I'm gonna come down. Not allowed to come down. Everybody get nervous now, everybody get nervous. I almost failed the first service, by the way. Candy said, don't come down. I said, no, I gotta come down. I'm breaking protocol. We heard a service one time, we read a service one time where a guy was preaching this passage and here's what he'd do. He would walk through, remember the pews back in the day? and they had a nice, nice hollow sound, he would come and just kind of rap on the pew and he'd knock and he'd say, Jesus is knocking, are you gonna answer? Jesus is knocking, are you gonna? I don't know about you, I was ready to answer anything at that point. I was so convicted, I'm, I don't know what I'm answering, but I'm answering. That, that's neat, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Here's the reality, and it doesn't take a lot to figure it out. There's one problem with that exegetical understanding of the text. The problem is, Jesus is not speaking to lost people. Who is the audience of the letter to Laodicea? Church folk. Jesus is knocking on the door of a church and he's trying to ask the men and women who claim to be believers to let him in his church. Here's what he's saying. He's saying in a sense, you guys are worshiping without me. You've been singing songs without me. You've been gathering without me. In fact, you're even living your life without me. Now, the the temptation is to say, okay, what can we do? Do we do better? Do we try harder? Do we sing louder? Do we read more? I mean, what do we do? Do we become self-sufficient? No, Jesus said, don't do any of that. Here's what he said, answer the door. Just open the door. And I wonder how many churches in America sing songs, read scripture, preach sermons, separate and apart, from the presence of Jesus. I've said this before, and I know this in my own life, but Jesus will not share the stage with anybody, including me. And I know in my own life, and I hate to admit this, but many times I get on this platform and Jesus will be waiting outside and he'll say, hey, you're doing just fine with your charisma and, and and your studying ability and your intellect. I'll be outside. When you need me, just call for me. Not really, but but really, in a sense, think about how many times have churches met in the world? How many times today have churches met separate and apart from Jesus? That's why he says, see, look. That word look there is a command. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, don't miss this. You may not get another chance. I may not knock again. See, when Jesus knocks on the doorpost of your heart, you need to open the door and let him in. Now, this is a funny looking door if you picture it. It's an interesting door. I don't know if you caught this. It's a door that only has one doorknob and it's on the inside. Because if there was a doorknob on the outside, Jesus would have let himself in his church. I mean, after all, it's his, right? Don't don't miss this. Jesus doesn't barge in the church. Jesus doesn't force himself. Like Jesus doesn't show up and say, I'm gonna show these lady to see you. Boom, I'm in, right? Don't do any of that. Don't do any of that. It's his church, it's his people, it's his plan, it's his redemption. And when he walks up to the church, notice what he does. Which, I love this, don't miss this. It shows us that you have to invite Jesus in. Hey, listen, next week, I'll tell you, I didn't tell any other service for time, but you do not wanna miss next Sunday. I mean, you're probably gonna come anyway, obligatory, but just telling you. (laughs) You wouldn't come, but the, the, those, those you know, heathens are going to come. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, cut that out, cut that out. No, those who call themselves Long Hollow will come once a year. They're going to come. Okay, well, we, and we love them. We want them to come. Golly, come. We want you to come. But I'm just saying, for, for, for those who are going to come, I'm just telling you. Next Sunday, the, the, the message I'm going to preach, it's an insight I learned, change my whole perspective of worship. I mean, you'll never worship the same again by what the t- it's in the text, but when we see it in the text, And it just shows us that when we worship, Jesus is inviting us in to a worship service that's been going on for eternity past and will continue to be going on for eternity future, a worship service where Jesus is the centerpiece, all the angels are praising him, and we get to enter in with him. How cool is that? We have to invite him into our life. Now, inviting someone in is interesting. I learned this as a kid. When I was a kid, 
uh, probably 10, 11, my sister was like six, seven, or eight, uh, when the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses would come to our home. Anybody remember when they'd come to your home and knock? And they knock on the door. I don't know why we did this. Honestly, my mom probably watching could tell more, but I don't know if it's because we were Catholic at the time and didn't know how to defend our faith or simply we didn't know any better. But when they would knock at the door, mom would say, hurry kids under the table. And I don't know why, I don't know why. We would literally, it, it was almost like, it was like the Jehovah's Witnesses could not see through the blinds of this gorilla and his sister like hiding under the table, like, come on, mom, really? And what we would do, anybody, anybody hid from people at the door before? Okay. <laughs> See, mom, we're not the only one. But they were persistent. I mean, they would knock a few times, and eventually, if you sat still long enough and didn't say a word, what would happen? They would eventually leave, right? And that's a funny story to think about, but here's the reality. What happens when Jesus knocks on the doorpost of your heart? Do you let him in? Do you make room for him? Or do you wait for him to leave? See, I think if we're honest, and if you're like me, you're like, man, I want, I want Jesus in my life. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here every week. You want Jesus to be a priority, but the reality is you don't have room to, to allow him in your life, so you don't let him in. It's not that you don't want to, you simply don't have any room in your life. Now, you may have seen this illustration before, but it's a perfect example of how this works. And I would say this illustration is a lot of the lives in here. So I want you to imagine this, this container, this jar is your life. This is the bandwidth you have. This is the energy, the effort, the mindset, the desire, the time. This is your schedule. This is your life. This is all you have time for. The sand represents things in life that don't matter. Things that really have no eternal significance. The pebbles represent things that matter a little, but mainly urgent things, things that you partake in that have no eternal value. And the big boulders here, the rocks, are the things that matter most. These are the things that are a priority. This is how our life works, and some of you are gonna understand this. So what happens is we start off our week by filling our life with meaningless things. Social media, swiping through Instagram, reading Facebook comments of people living their best life now. I mean, we just go through these, right? TV, Netflix, uh, video games, the entire week of spring break while I'm off of school. Parents, can I get an amen? <laughs> Texting endlessly to the night, FaceTiming, I never understand this, with teenagers that just FaceTime friends, leave the phone on, and go about their life. Anybody have any, if you have teenagers, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, are you talking to some, oh yeah. Yeah, we're talking, but I'm not talking. But anyway, I mean, I, that's what we do, okay? Things that, the, but anyway, uh, these are things, okay. And then what happens is after we do that, we start filling our time with things that are not necessarily bad, just activities, not necessarily great things, but just things that fill up. Golf outings with the guys every Friday. We're not talking about disc golf. Talking about regular golf, talking about ball golf. Uh, <laughs> travel ball, right, with the, I mean, golly, you gotta go travel. Activities that you partake in, building a platform for your life, right? Uh, trying to be somebody online, so you feel yourself with this life. And then you think, okay, and this is where most of you are right now. You're like, okay, Robbie, I'm ready. And then by the time you start putting things that matter, things of eternal significance, you realize, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any room. Like I want God in my life, but I don't have any room for the things that matter. Now here's what I learned from the last service. If you actually bang your hand real hard, watch this. No, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. I'm playing. You know what it does? If you bang real hard and try to squash it in, you actually break apart. You know, someone told me this, I never forgot this. They said, if you don't depart with the Lord regularly, you will come apart eventually. If you don't depart regularly, you'll come apart. Here's how it works, and this is interesting. Just a, just a minor change of priority. Your life again, instead of starting with the things that are insignificant and temporal, let's say you start with the things important. You make God a priority. So what you say is, hey, I'm gonna start spending time with God right when I wake up in the morning. 
I'm gonna set a discipline of reading the Bible. I'm gonna study the word. I'm gonna even memorize scripture. I'm gonna worship the Lord. I'm gonna come to church on Sunday. I'm actually gonna make God a priority. And you start to put the things that really matter first in life. And you realize, okay, after that, let's see if I have room for this. And then you start to realize, okay, travel ball's not bad as long as I come to church on Wednesday. Anybody with me? I can go to the Tennessee Titans game as long as I come to the eight o'clock service. I can go to a Saturday night concert as long as I come to the 11.15. Can I get an amen, right? I mean, so you, so you kind of, you put these things in. And then after you put those things in that are a little important, urgent, then you start to realize that the little insignificant things, they actually have space for it, which is fascinating. And it's all about what? It's all about priority. Now, here's what's cool. Even if you don't have room for the insignificant things, it doesn't matter because you've made the thing that's internal, the thing that's important, a priority. Friends, don't miss this. When Jesus, before he's even born, when Jesus goes to Bethlehem, I don't know if you caught this, but the son of God, Mary and Joseph, about to bring it, not just any baby, like this is God's son, the townspeople have no what? No room for him. And that's not just literal, that's a spiritual insight that at the very birth of God's son coming to the world, the religious leaders, we don't have room for him. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the people he came to save, the Jews, they had no room for him. When I read that story, here's what I ask myself. Because it's easy to say, well, the town people, man, those people are crazy. Those Sadducees, we can throw rocks at them. The question I ask myself is this, if I were the innkeeper, would I have made room for Jesus? If I was the one, I don't know. I hope I would. I thought this week, what is the problem with us? Why, why don't we make Jesus a priority? Why don't we make room for Jesus? I think it boils down to this, and I say this with love. I think the problem is we really don't love Jesus. We really don't love Jesus. We like the idea of having fire insurance from hell, but to actually spend time alone with Jesus, we don't really have time to hang out with him, which means he's not really important in our life, right? When I sat on the porch, I told you a couple weeks ago, for 10 months leading up to the revival at Long Hollow, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and I'll never forget this day, and I journaled about it after. I'll never forget this. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you don't really love Jesus. I'm like, what do you mean I don't really love Jesus? Yeah, yeah, I love Jesus. What are you talking about? I tell people I, love, I preach I love Jesus. And then he spoke to my heart. Well, if you loved him, you'd think you'd spend more time with him. I would ask you that. When was the last time? No, really. When was the last time you sat alone in the presence of God with just you and God alone? No phone, no distraction, no friends, no people, no agenda, just you and God, not trying to get something from God, just being with the Lord Jesus Christ. If Candy and I were dating and I talked to her and said, baby, I love you so much. I just love spending time with you. I really do. I just cannot wait to spend time. Oh, but by the way, you don't mind if I invite some friends to go along with this everywhere we go. In fact, I made a Valentine's Day dinner plan at Ruth Chris and I invited Robert and Brandon to join us. You don't mind, do you? table for four. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna do a walk after the dinner in the park downtown, and I've invited Jeff Borton and Russell Irwin to join us to sit on the bench next to us. They'll be on the sides. You won't mind if they join us, right? After a while, Candy would start to question my love for her. Why? Because I never, watch this, I never spend time with her alone. Friends, again, I told you I'd say it with love. Brother, I question your love for Jesus by the time you wanna spend with him. Sister, I would question your love for Jesus by the lack of time you spend. Here, here's the reality, when was the last time you spent time with God and God alone? Here's how it works. There's no love without intimacy and there's no intimacy without time alone. There's no love without intimacy. There's no intimacy without time alone. And so this morning, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to let Jesus in. And I'm talking to Christians here. 
to let Jesus in your life, to open the door and allow him to come out, to put him first, to not put him last or second, to put him first in your life. And so we're gonna transition into a time of taking the Lord's Supper. I think it's a perfect transition, why? Because the Lord's Supper is a, is a Christian family experience, right? It's a time for us as the body of Christ to gather together and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we do that by examining our own heart. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, before you partake of the Lord's Supper, examine your own hearts to determine if there is, get this, unconfessed sin in your life. And so let's just do something for a moment. Just gonna be a minute, but I want you to do this. I want you to get alone with the Lord. And by the way, if you don't have a cup, raise your hand, we'll bring you one. There are guys all in the balcony and down here. If you don't have a, a cup with a wafer and, um, and the bread. Before we open it up, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit just for a moment, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in and then exhale slowly. And as we sit in the presence of God, we're gonna ask the Lord to reveal any unconfessed sin in our life. Anything maybe we're too ashamed to confess, anything that we have forgotten or anything we minimize or justify, Lord, we're asking that you would right now by your spirit, gently, lovingly, would you just make us aware of anything in our life that would hinder us being fully used by you, that would hinder intimacy with you, fellowship with you. And if the Lord reveals that to you now, would you, would, would you just confess that to him? Just lift it up to the Lord. God, I'm naming it, I'm confessing it to you. Next Thursday will be the day that Jesus meets with his disciples for the last time. And basically the Bible said that he took the cup uh, and he took the bread and he basically redefined it for them. And so if you have one of these, you could take the wafer and um, you can open it up. And uh, on Thursday night, I believe he celebrated the Passover a day before the normal Passover because he was gonna die. And the disciples had participated in this meal for a long time, their entire life, it was Passover. He took bread, a visual picture of sustenance and satisfaction, and he broke it. And he said, this is an image of what's going to happen to my body in the days ahead. And I believe that image reverberated in their minds and souls for the weeks to come. And so we thank the Lord for his sacrifice for us. Father, we thank you for your body being sacrificed in our place. It was our sin that put you on the cross. We should have died, not you. And yet you gave willingly yourself for us. And so we're thankful today. We say, thank you, Jesus. Say that with me. Thank you, Jesus. Say it again. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your body in our place. Amen. And the Bible says that he took the cup um, and he said, this is a new covenant in my blood. You know, you probably wonder like a lot of people, why so much blood? Why, why so much killing? Why, why so many in, innocent animals? Uh, why the Passover lamb every year? This is the way God set up the system. In the, the book of uh, Genesis, after the first couple sinned, God said, or before they sinned, he said, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Not just a physical death, although it was, but a spiritual death. At the end of their life, they died. In order for God to be a just God that keeps his word, he has to punish people who sin. But he gave them a way out of it. Basically, he said, if you sacrifice an innocent animal by slitting the throat and removing the blood, here's the deal, life was in the blood. And so when an animal died, it was as if the animal took the place of the human. It was their blood in exchange for our blood. Isn't that cool how God works? So God says, hey, when this animal dies, you live. Now, the good news for us is we don't have to go home today in our backyard and sacrifice a goat, ram, or lamb, amen? 
We have a once and for all sacrifice who went to the cross, gave his life willingly, so we don't have to die. He took our sin upon his back. It was our sin that put him on the cross, not his. And because of him, we're free. And so we thank the Lord for his blood. Father, we thank you that it's your blood that covers our sin. We don't earn salvation. We didn't do anything to deserve it. And yet you give it freely to anyone who will allow you in, not just to the doorpost of their home, but on the doorpost of their heart. And so Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for the blood that gives us access to the Father, that gives us a way to heaven, but also gives us power today. Thank you for the blood, we say. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,